and I on days you know when days sometimes you have long days and sometimes you have a bad day at work and sometimes you have you are really ill I can't think of anything more comforting than my khichdi with ghee and dahi and papad you agree and sometimes my curd rice and you know if if on a weekend I have time I sit and enjoy my food like meditation <laughs> and if I travel to places I explore it through food so if I go to a place and say I like something and I pick it up and I come back I learn it and I make it over and over again I think my family members get fed up of me so recently I went to Bhutan and I picked up from our neighbors their, their national dish Emma Dachi it is so good and I'm sure most of us love our food but I've come to tell you that our food system has been systematically been broken that a handful of corporations control a majority over 50% of the seeds the commercial seeds that a handful of corporations control over three quarters of the pesticides in the world and with this concentration of power comes the concentration of seeds of pesticides of patents of data and even innovation and GMOs are really trying to get a wedge in this market that the GM industry has been pushing this as the panacea as the silver bullet for the last 25 years of its existence saying that this is the only technology that will feed us that will feed the growing population I've come to tell you that it's one of the most controversial technologies introduced to mankind and like with most technologies you know that gets redundant in the West that gets rejected by the North northern countries and finds it sway into southern countries like us into developing countries like us I'll give you the example of nuclear technology for instance now most of the northern countries are saying let's not go ahead with it we've learned already we've burnt our fingers we know now what is better and moving more towards renewable and countries like us we are going on expanding nuclear or you take the example of big dams Countries like the US are already blowing up their big dams. And we are going ahead and continuing to build big dams. So it's almost like what the West rejects, we accept. What the West learns its mistakes from, we continue to say, no, no, we need it. Right? So is the case with GM technology. Like I said, the GM industry has been pushing this as a silver bullet, as the only solution, the be all, the end all for food security for nutritional security and countries like India and the developing world say you know what we will volunteer to be the technological dump yards of the world we almost seem to take pride in it but the fact of the matter is that genetically modified organisms are a distraction they are a distraction from food security there is a distraction from nutritional security when you have gm it's handing over our food production to this handful of companies and what companies know best is profit they don't understand ecology but what happens is as a result of this is you have less biodiversity you have more farmers locked into a system of dependence on agrochemicals like pesticides so gmos are really a distraction from the food uh, from uh, the food security from the nutritional security that can be achieved through ecological farming and the solutions are already lying there gmos create a system of dependence so i'll talk a little more of why i think gmos are a distraction gmos create a treadmill of dependence they make the farmers go to the market to buy the seeds and before i go on to explain more i'll talk about you know if any of you have 
had any experience in farming or have family members, maybe your parents, maybe your grandparents, some experience, some relation, and you can go and have a conversation with them and you'll find out that seeds were never bought from the market. They were actually saved after every season. They were actually shared with friends. They were shared with family. They were shared with neighbors. A farming family never went to the market to buy the seeds. But in the case of GMOs, the farmer has to go and buy the seeds. And then the farmer has to go and buy the pesticides that go with it. It's like, you know, buying your iPhone. You know what I mean? Some of you, I'm sure, have an iPhone. And then when you buy an iPhone, then, then you lose your charger. You have to go back to the iStore because no other charger will work. Or you need a pair of headphones and you have to go back to the iStore. Or then you need a converter and nothing else is going to work. You get the drift, right? So it's locking, in this case, the farmer into a system of dependence onto a treadmill where he's constantly having to depend on the market to go back to buy, to buy, to buy. And if you take the example of GM cotton in India, BT cotton, which is the only GM crop which is permitted in India, you'll find out that more and more pesticide is being used. And therefore, the farmer has to go to the market again and again for that. So I'll tell you a little more of the myths that are promoted. Contrary to popular belief, the use of pesticides actually shoots up. So what, what is common knowledge is, or what is popular knowledge is that if you use GM, your use or dependence of pesticides will go down. And that's a good thing, right? And so you'll say, hey, maybe we should go for GM so your pesticide use goes down. But actually, that's far from the truth. If you take the example of BT cotton again in India, you'll find that over a period of time, the pest develops resistant to the pesticide that the plant is exuding. So GMOs are developed in such a way to count only one pest, so that the plant produces pesticide to deal with only one pest. And over a period of time, that pest develops resistance. And then you need more pesticide. And then you need to create a new gene stack. So that's how it works. It's, if I use a simplistic example, it's a little bit like having an alcoholic, no? Where for the first time you'll get high in a little bit of alcohol. And then you need more and more alcohol to get the same effect. So it's pretty much like that. And when I say, what happens in agriculture when the dependence goes up? You have the creation or the development of, su of superbugs and superweeds. And this is a well-documented fact in the US. If you, if you look at the numbers in the US, for instance, the, the amount of pesticide or herbicide alone since the time GMOs were introduced in the US has gone up by 383 million pounds. It's not gone down. It's gone up. It might give you the impression of going down first, but then eventually goes up. And one of the other things that is talked about in the world of GMOs is that GMOs is the only way to ensure climate resilience, to saline, salinity related issues, to floods, to droughts. And you, we all know, we're all seeing climate change impacts. We're all seeing more droughts, we're all seeing more floods, we're all seeing more salinity. I mean, we don't experience it ourselves, but we've heard of it at the farming end. And we are made to believe that GMOs in agriculture are the only way to counter that, are the only way to deal with these shocks, with these climate-related shocks. But the fact of the matter is, as of today, there are to deal with those climate-related shock. It's also a fact that conventional breeding technologies like marker-assisted selection or MAS is, are already in the market and are already helping farmers deal, deal with all these situations of floods, droughts, salinity. 
all of those situations. So what, hap what is the real solution? When you have GM crops that can only operate in monocultures, GM crops cannot work in a diversity. GM crops only work in a monoculture. And monocultures by nature are susceptible. They are susceptible to viral attacks. They are susceptible to diseases. They are susceptible to pest attacks, to climate shocks. Name it. Because it's simple. If all of us in this room had the same immunity and say there were a viral attack, Say there were a viral attack and we didn't have the immunity to deal with it. There's a possibility that this entire room would be wiped out. Right? But if you have a diversity, if all of us are varying, then maybe some people would fall sick and some people wouldn't. So is diversity like that. It's, the diversity is so beautiful. It adds resilience to all survival. Right? And biodiversity... <laughs> Therefore, in agriculture, it becomes the key to ensuring or it becomes the only insurance against climate change, if I were to say so. Biodiversity is the only insurance against climate change. And India is full of this biodiversity. It's replete with this biodiversity. And did you know that India, just if I take the example of rice, there were over 10,000 varieties of rice in India. Can you even imagine that? I know a handful like the pony when I come to this part of the country or the gandashala if I go to West Bengal or the black rice if I go to Manipur. But there were 10,000 varieties only of rice. And India or Asia is the biodiversity hub not only of forests but also agriculture. And this biodiversity can actually come to our rescue. So one of the key things when I'm saying all these solutions exist, you'll still have corporations, you'll still have sometimes governments make you believe that you know we are a growing population and we need to fill, feed this growing population. How do we do that? How do, do we do that? GMOs is the only long-term solution. But I want to put it in a little bit of a context. In the context of re actual food production as of today. So did you know that 75% of the food that is produced today is actually meant for livestock or biofuels or as, or as ingredients for the junk food industry? And only 25% or a quarter of what is produced is directly meant for direct human consumption. It's a well-recognized fact. It's not unknown completely. Even the UN's FAO will talk about the fact that over 30% of the food that we produce today is wasted. In the Western world, it's wasted at the consumer end. Too many spots on this apple. This pear looks too blemished for me. Let's bin it. In the developing world, most of it is lost because of poor storage facilities and distribution losses. So what about that? So does it mean actually that if we produce more food, more people would be fed? Not necessary. We are actually already producing more enough food for everybody today. Enough nutritious food for everybody today. And even enough for a foreseeable increase in population. The only way we can ensure best guarantee for people to ensure uh, they have access to nutritional food and healthy food is to ensure availability. Is to ensure affordability of a diverse an unprocessed food basket. From the, uh, from the science perspective, 
ecological agriculture model the ecological agriculture model has already been recognized as the best model to ensure food and nutritional security for a growing population so 400 scientists the best scientists from across the world came together in the united nations funded iwasd study and they said this is the best model small and marginal farmers producing diverse food we don't need large monocultures we don't need everybody producing potatoes we don't need everybody producing corn and wheat we need diversity the more the diversity the more the nutrition i'm sure you'll agree if i tell you that i can feed you a sack of potatoes every day and that's not going to ensure nutritional security will it from from the market's perspective it's a it's something that you must be fee observing in your day to day life that there's more organic food made available in the market there's more demand for organic food there's more demand for ecologically grown food why because people are becoming increasingly aware of what they want on their plate if i were to take the example of us alone the us organic market stood at a uh, 43 billion in the year 2015 and it it's growing rapidly every year in every country so far ge has not lived up to any of the promises that the industry has made that's a fact and if we have to feed the world we have to adopt ecological agriculture understanding the human the fundamental human right is the right to food so it is possible to imagine a world where we grow more locally where we grow without agrochemicals it is possible that our farmers are actually compensated fairly and that all of us have abundant and healthy food it's not a dream in many pockets of the world this model this model which involves moving away a little bit from subsistence and moving away from the extremely destructive industrial farming towards a more holistic model it is possible that you have more knowledge sharing that you use local seeds that you you have more diversity where you have a systems approach where you know your trees will attract the birds that will eat the insects and so on and so forth and that love we owe ourselves thank you